you know, in Ohio in the 70s, it was uh, really a period of uh, the extended House of Pain, not the group, uh, the reality of the House of Pain. It started with uh, May 4th, 1970, where I was a student at Kent State University, and I was friends with two of the four students that were shot and killed by the National Guard um, <clears throat> that day of the protest against the expansion of the Vietnam War into Cambodia by President Nixon, then President Nixon. And um, it was an unbelievable experience because it completely changed me from some kind of free love, uh, pot smoking hippie into a very politicized person that had a new agenda and a new well founded anger that's carried me through for 20 years hence. Uh, the stories were lies, the uh, way the media portrayed it, of course gave me an early lesson in distortion and how uh, what you see isn't what you get. And uh, uh, the, the papers that day locally in Kent, Ohio said four guardsmen killed by students. So uh, townspeople were deputized by the local sheriff to go around with 30 gauge shotguns hanging out at the windows of their Chevys looking for students to shoot. <clears throat> you know, we had a curfew for a week helicopter patrol, the National Guard, battalions and battalions. There were thousands of National Guard patrolling the town on an hourly basis. And just that experience kind of like uh, shifted dimensions for me that, that probably didn't start to get better until I saw Diamond Dogs uh, tour by David Bowie in 1974 and realized <clears throat> uh, that maybe I could do something creative about the way I felt, which became Devo. Explain uh, the birth of the group, the way it turned from an idea into a... Uh, I, was, uh, I was teaching drawing and design at Kent State University, and I met uh, uh, Mark Mothersbaugh, my partner in crime in Devo. And he was an artist, and we were both attracted to the same kind of uh, what we called then uh, the high and the low, which then, since then, 20 years later, become a a major show in New York or something. Anyway, high and the low was to combine the lofty ideas of art history and literature with the crassest, most ridiculous, most inane kind of uh, expressions of pop culture. So we were, you know, mixing Dada ideas with uh, Ronald McDonald and, and uh, doing performance art, although there was no word for performance art and that we didn't know what we were doing then. But we would show up at bad art shows where people had painted, you know, 50 landscapes with birds and trees, and uh, we would be dressed in butcher's jackets and uh, animal bag bandoleros and go in and pronounce our judgment on the show. And we had a subhuman mascot named Pootman that was really a friend of ours that wore a black wrestling suit and a black wrestling mask because the World uh, Wrestling Association was big deal in Ohio and especially Akron. And so it was easy to get the clothes. And uh, so it was our foray into costumes and masks early on to kind of make a statement. And we would feed him milk out of the enema bag every time he gave the right answer when we'd point to a painting and say, how bad is this? And he would wiggle and he couldn't talk, of course. He'd wiggle and hold his nose and uh, push his butt at the painting and then we'd feed him as a reward. And we would get kicked out and threatened and campus police would come after us. And so we, we were having fun at that time making people angry. So you had the idea that you ought to step from that. I guess the first step was into film. Well, the, the first step was uh, we, <clears throat> when we, um, when we took our influences from the kind of artistic direction we had and, and started applying it to music. It was because Mark played music and I played music as a hobby, uh, just because we liked music. And I, I was playing in a blues band and he was playing in a band that was doing hard rock covers and uh, we, we decided to stop doing that. We thought that was ridiculous not to take the implications of all this visual art and apply it to our music. So we said, what would this art that we've been doing that we called de-evolution, we called our art de-evolution and we were doing art devo. And we said, what would happen if, if there was music and there was devo music, what would that be like? And we started getting together at night uh, because there was really nothing else for people that were directed towards being creative in Akron, Ohio, or Kent, Ohio, to do at night except to get together and be creative because uh, there were no distractions. And, um, 
no attractions. Um, unless you were on the football team or the manager of a McDonald's, you couldn't get a date. So we made music. And we started taping our music on a four track. And we spent about three years doing that and then decided we would play out uh, in public. So we, we started doing that by lying. And I pretended to be the manager. And I would lie to these club owners and tell them we could do uh, covers of uh, Bad Company and and the captain and Tennille, and we'd get booked, and we'd get about three songs into the set, and they'd throw us out. Once we got paid to leave, which was really nice, because we usually didn't get paid. Uh, why did they uh, throw you out? Well, obviously, w people were, were, were angry when we would misrepresent ourselves like anybody would be. <laughs> uh, we'd come and play just, you know, just to, just to make them mad. I mean, of course, we knew it was going to make them mad because uh, what they wanted was what they'd been getting. They were programmed for conformity, and Devo was, was walking in there with original material that didn't sound like anything, didn't look like anything that they already liked. And that's just totally unacceptable. Uh, usually, it's unacceptable at any time in history. It had nothing to do with the 70s. It's just always unacceptable. And we knew that. So can you, just for the people who, 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 um, for the people who don't have a concept of this, can you just give us an idea of how it looked from the audience point of view, what they would see and hear? When Devo first played out, we, would, uh, we, we went to a um, janitorial supply store, which there were many of in, in Akron, Ohio, and we bought these uh, gray work suits with short sleeves that we thought were really cool fashion. And then we bought clear plastic face masks and uh, <clears throat> uh, blue helmets that we found in a toy store that were um, children's versions of uh, hard hat helmets, but they were in bright blue. I think they were by the Ideal Toy Company. And we put those on and looked at the whole thing together and said, that looks good. And then we took uh, our instruments out, which had all been modified and customized and run through all the devices of the time, Mutrons, wah-wah pedals, whatever we could find. And Mark had a Moog synthesizer, a mini Moog. He was the only guy in Ohio that had one, I think. And we bought a second one and dismantled it. And his brother, who was the drummer, um, created a homemade set of electronic drums. So Devo really looked like some agiprop group that was just playing this industrial noise that had structure and progression to it. I mean, you know, in a much more little rascal's manner than, say, Nine Inch Nails does today. What kind of music were you all listening to then? Who were your inspirations, your traditions? Whose shoulders were you standing on musically? When we were first doing this music, we, we certainly were uh, interested in commercial music, music that was happening, being played on the radio, embraced by the media. Uh, but that wasn't our only interest. I mean, certainly, we, Mark and I both liked uh, very much uh, Roxy music, early Roxy music with Brian Ferry and Brian Eno together in the group, and David Bowie. Um, I mean, I mentioned that really it was the Diamond Dogs concert in 1974 by David Bowie that, that gave me hope that uh, the ideas that Devo had could be put together in some formal way and, get, and we could get a voice in the marketplace. We could be seen and heard. But we were, in addition to that music, we were into uh, bad TV soundtracks and uh, Italian movie soundtracks, and certainly Nina Rota, uh, Ennio Marconi, things like that. And do you have um, a vision for yourselves as um, a realized pop a band or a punk band? I guess they hadn't invented the term yet. I mean, how did you see yourselves fitting into all this? You know, Devo never saw themselves as a punk band, and we were almost <clears throat> freaked out when, um, when uh, we were first getting any kind of public rec recognition that we were being called punk, because, you know, we still really, like any new artist, really want to be understood. You have the foolish idea that you can be understood, that there isn't something bigger than you that has its own destiny, its own momentum that's going to sweep you up in it. And we didn't like being called punks simply because we saw the punks as only historical punks. There was nothing truly punky about them because they were looking back and taking all their ideas about how they looked, the sound of the music, the progressions, and the kind of anger. Uh, they, were taking, they, were, they were taking it from the 60s. And we just found that kind of simple-minded and historical. We thought we were the true punks because 
we were hated by everybody. We were punk scientists. We were doing something that looked wrong, sounded wrong. We talked about things that nobody was talking about. We talked about the, the end of uh, the capitalist dream we, uh, being viable anymore. We talked about the end of consumerism, talked about the environment. We talked about the foolishness of thinking you know what you're doing, uh, you know, that the human isn't at the center of the universe. We talked about all these things that people just thought we were crazy because it was still a very, very kind of uh, linear kind of universe. That We decided um, that the only way we could crack the music business was to completely put the whole vision together. We uh, were thinking back then about the marriage of, uh, of visuals and music and theatrics and the philosophy as, a, as an entire package to kind of create a Devo universe where the characters in Devo and everything would be something you could revisit. It would have nothing to do with being trendy. It would be like a movie that you rent today and rewatch or kind of like the Three Stooges episodes. And uh, certainly they're still around, more Stooges than ever, as a matter of fact. But so we, uh, we had these songs, and we picked Mongoloid and Jocko Homo, two of our first songs. And we went to uh, Queen City Records in Cincinnati, where we could get a cheap deal, where a lot of the R&B in the area had always been pressed up. And for $2,000 that Mark and I made by silk screening designs and selling t-shirts, we, uh, we made our own record, our own 45, on Boogie Boy Records, our own record label. Uh, after our character of Boogie Boy, the, uh, <clears throat> the infant as old as the mountains but is yet unborn, the kind of Yoda character. And uh, we passed it around to, to every record store we could find, and I posed as our manager and wrote letters of introduction and um, sent it along with our first homemade video, which was The Truth About Devolution. Uh, that we had filmed the same year on 16 millimeter film with more of that t-shirt money. And uh, we, I sent it around to all the record companies and I sent it to Saturday Night Live where Dan Aykroyd promptly threw it in the wastebasket. We were to later find out. And uh, nothing happened whatsoever, nothing. Uh, nobody responded, nobody called back. Um, except then the film was part of the Ann Arbor Film Festival and it won an award for best film short because people either were horrified by it or laughed at it which is the absolute perfect response that we wanted because we were dealing with that fine line of the hard work of really being smart and appearing stupid and that's that's a lot of work and so it's that it's the it's kind of like ironic idiocy that was at the center of Devo and because of that film touring as part of the package of the Ann Arbor Film Festival of award winners, Kip Cohen of A&M Records at the time, an A&R man there, saw it and remembered that this package had been put on his desk and called us up in Akron and offered us uh, $2,000 if we drive out in a van and play at the Starwood Theater in Hollywood. So we did, and he promptly passed. <laughs> And it was, it was a perfect introduction to the music business. We, we were called into his office the next day after performing. And he says, well, guys, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, it's like, you're not my kind of girl. I mean, you could march seven girls in here. They could be all done up. They could be naked. I don't care. Nothing wrong with them. Maybe they, one's got too big a nose. I don't care. It's just not my kind of girl. Sorry. I was here. I was in Hollywood. I knew it. I started to learn. Uh, a lot of people are interested to know how we got hooked up with Brian Eno, and it was very simple and very convoluted at the same time. We, um, we got tired of waiting for David Bowie to produce our first record. He had promised that he would through his lawyer, Stan Diamond, and of course he was busy doing so many things he couldn't possibly keep his commitment, and time was dwindling, and we went back home to uh, Ohio from uh, Los Angeles and at Christmas time decided we had to play again and 
I had booked us into CBGB's and, and um, Max's Kansas City in New York, and Brian Eno was in New York doing some work of his own, and David had called him on the phone and said, Something about Devo, yeah, there's these guys from Akron, Ohio that uh, look like they're out of the play Ubu Roy and they want me to do something with them and uh, I can't. And he said, I think I saw them in, in the Village Voice. I think they're playing here. And so Brian came and saw us at, at Max's Kansas City. We went back to his hotel and made a deal to, for him to produce the record in Germany. Right. Let me let me um, move back and and uh, mention how David Bowie actually popped into the picture to begin with. We had <clears throat> sent his management team a tape along with the many others back when we made our first record, and of course never heard from him. But his lawyer had heard of us through his management, and his lawyer Stan Diamond contacted us when we were in Los Angeles playing for Kip Cohen, thinking that Devo was about to do something, about to break, and uh, wanted to know if we needed a lawyer. <laughs> and uh, we soon found out that whether you think you need a lawyer or not, you need a lot of them, because uh, they say so. So I'm, you know, it was the, uh, there were no lawyer jokes back then, but I, I, I'm certainly sympathetic with any lawyer joke I hear today. But Stan uh, ended up going out of the picture as fast as he came in because there was a conflict of interest try trying to sign us to a deal with David Bowie and representing Devo at the same time. It was kind of uh, both hands in the pockets. So did you have a sense at that point in time that you were about to happen? Did you I know that something was percolating? I think every, every creative person, um, when, they're, when they're finally being recognized by the public on any level, They've waited so long to be recognized, and they always knew who they were for so long before anybody else um, gives them any kind of uh, validity outside of themselves that there's a kind of perverse thing that happens. At first, you know, your egos go too far in the wrong direction up because you think you des deserve even more because you've been booted down and kept down so long. So when, when things started happening, our attitude was, well, it's about time. Um, you know, we didn't get the total picture yet. That was to come later. Um, so can you tell us about the making of Are We uh, Not Drunk Men? The process, the, the uh, time it took, how it was to go into a studio with a producer and to make the first record, first album? Are We Not Men actually was the, was the result of uh, all those years in the basement with uh, the guys back in Akron, Ohio, where we had written a lot of songs, gone a lot of strange directions, and decided on the best stuff. You know, we did it by process of group elimination. If somebody hated something, it was done, because we figured the excesses of everybody's private aesthetic were better trimmed off by the consensus of the group, which started the whole conscious corporate image of Devo being uh, that the group was more important than the individual, and that the individuals were just manifestations of this bigger idea that Devo wasn't about uh, the traditional rock and roll values of look at me, look at me, look at me. It was a little bit more like look at us. <laughs> but um, we, we, uh, when we finally made that first record, Are We Not Men, We Are Devo, we had had the benefit of weeding out three years' worth of basement tapes down to the songs, the ten songs or so that we liked best. And we had to record the record because in six weeks because we had such a low budget to do it. Uh, which always makes a better record. Uh, the more money a group seems to get for their records, the less good they get. Um, how long did it took? It took six weeks. Did you do it as? Did you do it as a? Did, uh, did you do it as a? Did, did you do it as a, a live process or an uh, overdub process or combination? When we recorded, are we not men? Uh, finally, got to actually record it. We were flown to Germany, got out of the plane in Cologne were picked up by uh, Connie Plank, Brian Eno's uh, engineer, and Brian in a uh, big Mercedes that we all had to pile into. And 
we went down the Autobahn at about 90 miles an hour to a little place, place called Neunkirchen and uh, into a studio where we were on a farm with nowhere to go and uh, nothing else to do but record. And we would get up every morning and have bizarre German breakfast with breads and strange party meats that looked like Monsanto tiles. And uh, we were all getting sick and going in around 11 o'clock and staying there till 11, 12 at night, recording live one track over and over, just playing it till it was perfect, and then overdubbing anything that might have to be overdubbed or adding instruments, but mostly live with discrete feeds to all the channels. And Brian Eno played on a lot of the tracks, although I don't think in the final mixes any, anything that he played was used, but he, uh, his singing was used. Um, so you heard the playback of these cuts, and did you think you had something there? Or you so how did you feel when you started to hear your tracks played the back? Were you were you uh, thrilled or pleased or surprised or shocked or what? Um, when we first started hearing uh, real recordings, you know, we'd never done anything except a a, tw uh, a four track. And when we started hearing real recordings, we were actually horrified because it, it was so sterile uh, compared to the, uh, the goo and the noise you get out of crude recordings. I always felt that Devo was best because it, it was so oriented towards uh, the, the kind of underpinnings uh, and, and subliminal aspects of creativity that, that I felt when it saw the light of day, something was lost because we, it was suddenly less subversive. It was less about the performance art that we'd been doing. And since we'd never really had intended to be a real band anyway, but rather just a concept on film, we were kind of horrified that there we were s submersing ourselves in the very scene that we always made fun of. Uh, now we were just a band on a stage, like the band who fell to earth. And so when we first played in, in New York at CBGB's, the Dead Boys, who kind of were the uh, reigning royalty of punk at the CBGB's at the time in uh, mid-77, uh, hated us. They just they couldn't believe that CBGB's was letting Devo play in yellow industrial suits. No, no self-respecting punk would go on stage without black pants, a white shirt, a skinny tie, and a, and a swastika. So because we weren't into being, uh, you know, throwing on icons of historical Nazis or something. We were more worried about the new Nazis that wore, you know, Ralph Lauren and Izod shirts and talked about granola and consensus. So we didn't understand why they hated us so much because we thought the proof was in the pudding. And, but, but they didn't like the style. They didn't like the presentation and they attacked us. They physically, during the set on uh, Jocko Homo, they took it personally about, because uh, Mark was pointing at them, uh, are we not men? You know, God made man, you're an ape, you know, chose a monkey to do it, you're the monkey. Uh, Cheetah Chrome, appropriate name, Cheetah Chrome, uh, attacked. And then so uh, then a couple other uh, members of the Dead Boys jumped in and we had a full fight on the stage, which then made us okay, kind of like some kind of uh, old all-American ritual of, uh, you know, male bonding where first you try to fight each other. Then we were all right, and then the, and the crowd liked us more, and then after that, the crowds got bigger at CBGB's. <laughs> Devo and the Dead Boys. Yeah. Sounds like um, a Creedence song or something. Um, will you tell us about um, a Devo show, the, sort of the, the full tilt show, you know, started with the film, and then the stuff you saw in the film was a part of the show. A friend told me that he saw a show where the stage was covered with a black a plastic and you uh, popped out of a hole in the middle of the plastic. It was really, you know? So much of our um, live performances were, were attempts to be extensions of the ideas and the philosophy behind the art we were creating that, the, uh, that Devo, at least, was, in fact, a show. People say they go to see a show, but they never saw any show. They just saw pretty much a band standing there, either you know, wasted or <clears throat> thrashing out, standing in still, uh, um, a bad version of the good recording that they'd heard on a record. So Devo 
always thought that was a bad idea, that if, if you go to a live show, it should be something, it should have an element or a level that you could not ever get by listening to a recording. So we integrated all our film concepts and our theatrical concepts into the show to, to push it, to multi-dimensionalize it. And we started really, you know, obviously like with everything that everybody has to start doing, really low budget. And all we did is buy black industrial plastic, the same kind of plastic, uh, I think it's PVC, that garbage bags are made out of. And we covered the whole stage in black plastic. We put on the, the yellow industrial work suits, and we only let the lighting people have um, lime green lights and, and uh, o amber orange lights. That was it. So the first thing we did is minimalize everything, clean it up, and, and telegraph it in a big way. And we moved on from there of doing things by 1981 where we had a uh, 17 foot by 25 foot rear projection screen with a 35 millimeter projector rear projected on, on there were the films in sync with the music because we had click tracks coming from the multiple audio channels and sequencer lines running into our monitors so we could play in sync with the music which today is done much easier through video technology as with uh, U2's last tour in 1993. But we, would, we were doing it the only way we could back then. And while the fans loved it and everybody went crazy to see these images of like explosions right on the beat of like computer generated women in a shooting gallery and blobs and french fries going through donuts in outer space, the press, of course, as with all the Devo things, slagged us off attacked us, said if we wanted to see a damn video game, we would have gone to a video arcade. What is this? Give us rock and roll. And uh, it's unfortunate because we were once again just a little ahead so that we got misunderstood. We were always misunderstood as uh, trying to cause trouble when really what we were trying to do is excite people and bring them new ideas. That was the whole point of Devo was the wit and the ideas and the concepts. That's, what, that's where our talents really lied. I mean, everybody could sing and play better than Devo that had records out, but they couldn't think like Devo. And we just ended up, for that reason, like not being embraced by, by the uh, insiders that ran the business. So we became kind of the pioneers who got scalped. You know, we did as good as we could, as long as we could, and, uh, you know, we got bitten by snakes. I saw that you tell the Los Angeles Times in 1980 that you felt you were mining the same areas and subjects as The Clash. I would try to explain to people that that just because you dress different or just because your chords are different in music doesn't mean that philosophically or aesthetically you're not in the in line with what's happening. I mean, nobody can escape their age they're in. I mean, we had the same kind of of um, righteous anger and indignation as as the Clash and the Sex Pistols, except we, maybe we just analyzed it a little more so that we thought through it, it wasn't just nihilism and it wasn't just a kind of historical rock and roll rebellion, which we thought were simple minded and silly to look at because in a corporate society where a few record companies control everything and a few TV networks controlled everything, if you're an act signed to a label and you pretend to be a rebel, it, was, it seemed to be a bad joke. I couldn't do that with a straight face. The real rebellion comes from the subversion of ideas, and I can't explain it sim more simple than the fact that in 1980, MTV came to us, which was then a fledgling idea itself, with only three cities where it was being shown. And uh, then um, executives, which were Bob Pittman and John Sykes, came and begged Devo, give us your videos. You're one of the only bands that have made any, and we don't have anything to program. But you see, guys, it's a really great idea, and you've got to cooperate. It's going to be free. You're not going to get anything for it but we're going to make you big. We give them our videos, they play five a day, and as soon as they went national and got a national franchise where MTV was a big deal, we couldn't get arrested on MTV because they would just refer to the charts and say, look, man, your song isn't happening. And every video we'd turn into them got censored until finally it came to a showdown where we turned in um, the video to That's Good off of Oh No, It's Devo. And I get a call from John Sykes where he says, okay, Casali, I know what you're trying to do. I saw the french fry going through the donut. I saw it. I know what you're trying to do. And I go, well, what do you mean, John? Yeah, what, what do you mean we're, what we're trying to do? What's so bad about it? And he goes, come on. And I said, well, you come on. What about the, the Billy Idol video you just had on where uh, 
The girl's in black leather, and he slaps her ass and sticks his head down between her legs and sings between her legs. And he says, that's different. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, that is different. But I think the difference was that in those videos, it's like the mainstream view of sex without humor, and it wasn't subversive at all. And it was like as long as everybody looked like they were having a bad time, okay. But when a French fry goes through a donut and you cut to a girl smiling, then you got something. Then you're a smart ass. So after that, MTV never, uh, they turned their backs on Devo. Isn't the essence of punk, quote unquote, punk being a smart ass in a certain sense? Yeah, I mean, a healthy disrespect for authority is what, you know, supposedly runs through the whole history of rock and roll and the whole history of individualism in America. But that's what Devo was making fun of. That's what the irony was about because. Once that's institutionalized, all you have is conformity of people pretending like they're rebelling in a specified manner. So it's a joke, and it's all become one big joke. That's why, you know, it's hard to, to deal with all the revisionist history and, and all the conscious retro music going on today in the present. It's like, it's frightening that uh, the things we talked about, about de-evolution and that progress isn't happening, but rather on unraveling and people getting dumber, seems to be true. I mean, Beavis and Butthead are just the romanticization of, of stupid, spiritless people. A, a, a kind of a really frightening kind of mass marketing of idiocy because it plays so well, which is bad. It's like, here we are, like, four years from the year 2000, with more information than ever, more technology than ever, and the art, the expression of art, music, dance, it's getting worse. I, I see less creativity, less diversity, less, I mean, one performance by Jimi Hendrix, one performance by Elvis Presley, one performance by The Who, one performance by David Bowie blows away a hundred of anything you can see today and still does on tape. I don't see anybody introducing me to anything that would shock me. I wish I could be shocked. You just, um, again, I, I wanted to ask you about uh, mining the same subjects and coming from the same points of reference as The Clash. How did you mean that? When I, when I claimed that uh, Devo and The Clash weren't that far apart, I simply meant that um, both groups, I think, were formed by, uh, just even historically, because we were peers, we were formed by a lot of the same kind of... Uh, inconsistencies and hypocrisies of, uh, of, of modern society that's supposedly free and uh, supposedly progressive and you look around and see um, that the most privileged leaders and, and people in power in the West were doing the most ridiculous, most uh, backward thinking things and mismanaging the resources and, and, and creating more and more problems on a larger scale. It, it didn't add up. In other words, there was something rotten and everybody knew that. Everybody kept seeing that, the mismanagement of resources, the ridiculous, outmoded ways of thinking, the, the, the refusal to look ahead. And it was very funny that, you know, people like Clash and Debo were being called negative, when really what was negative was the cynicism and the waste of the people in power. Um, a lot of people think that the reason that punk was so successful in England and uh, failed here is that there was a political situation. There was a, there was a, a political circumstance in England where Right. In the commercial sense, not in the yeah, punk in the narrow sense of the word where you had to play a certain way, sound a certain way on record, look a certain way, probably worked in England because England was A, much more fashion conscious, and B, poor. Uh, that kind of punk, that kind of anger certainly doesn't work in a 70s America where, you know, kids have plenty of toys to play with and daddy bankrolls you for anything you want. Now, that was soon to change, but at the time, uh, Americans weren't feeling that. So, if, if anything, music of rebellion or music that challenges establishment had to take a different form in America. It couldn't sound and look that way because it didn't relate to the culture. And uh, I, I always understood that. One of the themes of the sh show is up from the underground, the sense that rock and roll is continually reinventing itself. Starts off 
center and then comes in the mainstream. Do you think something's lost when groups, when Devo came up in the mainstream? Do you think that's just Something's always lost when any outside uh, uh, form of self-expression becomes embraced and becomes established. But that's the arc, and that is the, the, the journey that is so funny to, to, to Devo. I mean, we, we knew that. That's why we said the beginning was the end. That's why we made the first movie, The Beginning Was the End. We knew that we would follow the same inevitable arc as any corporation or any artist or anybody that's in business, uh, where there's a period of discovery, a period of uh, great hope and uh, great productivity, and then it gets codified, and then people start to believe their own hype and press, and then they start to think there's something other than they're not, and then they undo themselves. We knew it. It's inevitable. It's the way the brain works, and that's what we were always commenting on, is the, the most dangerous weapon to Devo was the human brain itself, not bombs. It was the mind and a lack of the use of it, or the inability of human nature to overcome itself. What's actually, as we approach the end of the century, humans, what's freaking everybody out is they have to learn to be different than what humans are. They have to reinvent themselves. It goes way beyond reinventing things outside yourself, uh, musical forms or, or, or our graphics or whatever. It's about the actual idea of who we are as a species. I think Devo's uh, final contention about the, the path of, of rock and roll, whatever that is, was that it had gone as far as it could. And I don't care if you bring in world beat music and influence it that way or bring in reggae and influence it that way, use uh, samples or don't use samples, whatever you want to do, it doesn't have the same power anymore just as paintings don't have the same power anymore, because it's becoming, as we race at a faster and faster pace towards bigger and bigger problems of survival, it's inadequate to be that important. It's merely relegated to, uh, you know, a runway show. It's a fashion show. That's all it is. It would take something that Devo never did, and certainly I haven't seen done by anybody else, to go to that next level and transcend, and I'm hoping I see that while I'm alive. Do you think that rock still has the power to change the world? <laughs> Whenever anybody asks me if rock has the power to change the world, it's, uh, it, all I can do is, is go back to things I can rely on, like Avo XOs and Verve Clicquot, because uh, no, I definitely don't think it has any power to change the world. It only reconfirms or reaffirms to people where they're at. One nice thing it does is it brings people that feel disenfranchised and lonely together. But of course, that can turn into the mob. So, can you tell us the kind of uh, reactions you got from the public when they saw this thing? Did, did they send you cards and uh, letters and things like that? The reaction we got from Whippet was, of course, um, very, very rabid, positive reaction from the fans and uh, very, very negative reaction from uh, the press, as, as one might expect, because this was tasteless. But of course it was supposed to be, and we never thought anybody would take it seriously. And we, we thought that people would see the irony and the sense of humor in it, and especially drawing on the classic Western motifs and cowboys. I thought it was pretty obvious we were uh, doing satire. But over and over, uh, what we were appalled to find out that kind of only, only proved our premise of de-evolution was that people actually took it literally and um, took it to heart and felt they had to take a stand on it. Can you explain sort of in a concise way the um, premise of Yeah, people always ask us, what was this de-evolution stuff, you know, like some sophomoric concept um, that was held over from art class, and that's exactly what it was, but we liked it. We thought it was as good of an explanation of the situation that human beings find themselves on in this planet 
it was as good of an explanation as the Bible or any other or Darwinian explanation. It just what we said was uh, that we were the uh, descendants of a long line of uh, carnivorous brain-eating apes, cannibalistic apes, that evolved in the in brain capacity and size evolved quicker than the uh, than the biology, the soft meat body that went with it, and went nuts, lost their sixth sense, uh, lost their connection to nature, and uh, lost their ability to uh, figure things out because they were at war with themselves, lost their tails. <clears throat> so de-evolution refuted the idea of linear progress, that people just keep getting better and better and better and more evolved towards some outside idea of perfection. Uh, we saw the opposite. We saw the world falling apart. We saw more and more chaos. We saw more and more injustice. We saw more and more have-nots. We saw more and more uh, unconscionable behavior by the most privileged, the most intelligent, and the most powerful people on the planet. What uh, gave you uh, the idea that this was something for a rock band to talk about? I don't know why we ever, uh, we ever thought we would um, be allowed to talk about such things, except that we were from Ohio, so we were foolish enough to just go with our instincts. <laughs> in Ohio, you uh, in Ohio you get to be big babies. In Ohio, you don't grow up. I don't think Devo would have ever happened uh, in Hollywood because there would have been too many producers and managers and agents around to second and third and fourth guess. There would have been too many articles around to already uh, create postmortems on a band that hadn't played once in a club yet. That it would have never had its incubation period. Would have never been allowed to stand up and walk. So I, I think that being isolated in Ohio and being totally ignored by our peer group whatsoever who just thought we were absolute losers and nutcases to be in a basement making this kind of music, that, that it, it, it fermented like a virus. I'm trying to remember if Devo was ever <clears throat> compared to anybody. I suppose that at the time, because um, our, uh, our fellow uh, uh, band uh, signees to labels were people like the B-52s and Talking Heads, we did get compared. We, we never really thought much about that one way or another because we didn't really think we were a lot alike. We realized maybe we were more alike than us and um, the Eagles, but um, it, it, it was just something foolish that people indulge in that have to fill up space uh, in newspapers and magazines. Um, I showed someone. I would have to say, you know, um, at the risk of being attacked again, uh, that when it comes to visuals, Devo was much ahead of the Talking Heads. If anything, if people saw a video of Satisfaction and thought it looked like the Talking Heads, it's because the Talking Heads ended up having better marketing than Devo because they, in terms of video, in terms of imagery and icons, started much later. Well, we had a number of videos in the can. Nobody ever saw the Talking Heads do anything except performances for a long time. So I think they looked like Devo. Um, I think David Byrne was imitating Mark Mothersbaugh. Can you uh, remember just switching here, com 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 just switching uh, completely here, the first time you heard Sex Pistols, the thing you saw, how it struck you? first time I heard the Sex Pistols, I was driving in a car in Los Angeles. And uh, somebody had a tape and they put it on. <clears throat> and it was, it was amazing because immediately I knew it was going to be huge. But I didn't care about it at all. I thought it was totally irrelevant. But it sounded exciting. It had the, uh, it had the mandatory um, entertainment factor of manic performance. 
It just sounded great. I could tell how it sounded. Devo's character, Boogie Boy, that showed up in our very first video and was our mascot all, all through all the videos, um, immediately, um, immediately connected with people. It was very strange. We never even anticipated that. But I think it was because it was so perverse yet so kind of sad. You know, he was so pathetic and vulnerable and twisted. It's like any masked or clowned figure, you know. I mean, I... I and the rest of the band always hated clowns. But a baby head, a big baby, literally a big baby, a baby adult running around, uh, confused and bemused by the world, almost like Harpo Marx character, because basically he's a mime in these videos. We have no dialogue, so he's a mute. He, has n he can only project a feeling. And the fact that it could come through that mask because of the way Mark moved and the way the context we put him in just affected people on that primal level, like the way a silent film does. We thought it was great once they really loved Boogie Boy. We used to play with that, and we'd always bring Boogie Boy out in concert, because he was the infant mascot of de-evolution. He was as old as the mountains, but as yet unborn. And uh, I'd like to see Boogie Boy again. Yeah, I think, the, I think the ideas and issues that Devo dealt with are not <clears throat> trendy issues, or, and they're not, they don't have a time and a place. They're universal. They're pretty timeless. They're always going to be true. They're always going to be things that every, everybody that starts thinking, anybody that has a life of the mind, any kid that's growing up, is going to deal with. Because he's dealing with the, the, the absurdity and the um, convoluted contradictions of what he sees and what he's told, just like, you know, the emperor's new clothes. And by the time anybody may be watching this, there, uh, there will be a, a, a CD-ROM on the market called Adventures of the Smart Patrol that re-initiates the public to the Devo universe and the Devo characters, uh, starting with Boogie Boy, and takes all these things that never really were allowed to get out, things that were going to be in the Devo feature film that never in fact existed after it was scuttled. Um, and uh, I think it'll show Devo kind of like Devo the next generation, just like Star Trek, Trek the next generation. You could get five new guys, not, not old Devo, us old guys, and start all over again. Right now, presently, with the music scene being what it is, I, I think that people have turned away from all kinds of outward comment, that is, uh, people dealing with themselves versus the world. They've turned inward dealing with themselves versus themselves. So that a kind of self-pity or um, um, nihilism or malaise you know, of depression is the norm of the day. And that's why everybody keeps looking back because they're afraid to look into the future and they're afraid to do anything new. They can't see, they're tired of what they got, and they're disgusted with even sometimes themselves, but they're afraid to move anywhere new. So all we have today, basically, is retrofitted music where you could play 20 records for any hit and say, here's the, here's the influences. In some case, one record, you know. In some case, you have a lawsuit. But uh, you can always play the influences and say, look, they took they took the bridge from there, and they took uh, the two verses from there, and they're singing like this guy, and it's amazing. It's just like a computer took everything, recombined it, and spit it back out. And the fact that some artists would spend so much time and energy consciously doing that of their own volition is pretty bizarre. Nobody's making them do it. They could do anything they wanted. And they have more tools and, and more reference points and uh, more, more ability than anybody in the past, and yet it's, it's uh, more vacant than ever before. Some people, I guess the corporate speak now is that the grunge is the rebirth of punk in the uh, 90s. That now that things in this country are as fucked up as they uh, were in uh, England in the 70s, this is like uh, the propaganda that it's now time for punk to be reborn uh, as grunge. Think that's true? Do you think the grunge bands stand on the shoulders of the Pistols, the Clash, Devo? 
Gee, when I think of grunge today, I, I don't see a big comparison to punk, but maybe, maybe I'm missing the boat, you know, because I see something that, that lacks any primal energy. I see something that lacks any, any innovation. I, uh, I see something that's boring. I don't think punk was boring, but maybe it was. You know, you're already doing their work. Um, as you look at the grand arc, if there is such a thing as the history of rock and roll, where do you see Devo fitting in? Where do I see Devo fitting in in the arc of the history in rock and roll? Um, Gee, that is tough. Somewhere between um, Muddy Waters and Captain Beefheart. It's a good place to be. <laughs> if you can retain your publishing. Um. I remember the first record I bought was uh, Don't Be Cruel by Elvis Presley. I went to the record store with my second cousin. You know, Ohio's that hillbilly kind of place, and uh, we were just old enough to be um, um, innocently messing around. You know, when our parents were playing cards, we were kissing, kissing cousins. And uh, Elvis spoke to me, and we bought Don't Be Cruel and listened to it probably 25 times sitting on the edge of the bed. I wouldn't have even known what to do if she wanted to go further. Uh, do you remember uh, when uh, the Beatles played on the Ed Sullivan Show? I certainly remember uh, the Beatles playing on the Ed Sullivan Show. Um, um, I immediately uh, wanted to be a drummer after that. Why? Uh, I wanted to be a drummer after I saw Beatles, uh, the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan Show because <clears throat> They all looked like mechanical dolls, and Ringo moved his head uh, back and forth perfectly to the beat while he drummed, and it was hypnotic. If rock and roll was a car, what kind of car would it be? <laughs> if rock and roll was a car, what kind of car would it be? It'd be a car with one flat tire. Um, what's your favorite album of all time? This is that desert island, you know. <laughs> Uh, my, my favorite album, the old Desert Island question, uh, if you had to take one album and, and uh, be imprisoned on an island the rest of your life, it'd probably be uh, Diamond Dogs. The Bowie album. Uh, by David Bowie. Diamond Dogs by David Bowie. Uh, what effect, uh, what effect uh, did rock and roll have on your parents? I think rock and roll had the same effect on my parents as it had with most parents that it tried to uh, dig their way out of the hole of World War II and put their nose to the grindstone and had to work for a living and really, you know, no light at the end of the tunnel kind of, uh, of uh, generation. They were horrified and they were threatened and frightened. It was, uh, it was barbarian, it was ungodly. It was going to be the end of uh, fundamentalist religion. Little did they know it just become the new fundamentalist religion. No, I think I mentioned before, rock and roll obviously doesn't change the world. It just uh, it reflects and magnifies what's there. And today, as I might have previously said, it's merely one more product, one more piece of entertainment for the corporate state. One song is my anthem, the greatest rock and roll song of all time. Uh, 
Probably would have to be sympathy for the devil. How's your hearing? How's my hearing? Well, I can hear you. Um, uh, we never played loud on stage, believe it or not. Devo uh, put all the volume out to the audience. We used little amplifiers and monitor systems and rehearsed so that we'd play on stage the same way we did in a um, rehearsal or recording studio. Five four, take eleven, camera roll twenty three. Um of all the people who died, of all the rockers who died, uh, whose death do you think is the greatest loss? Well, probably for me, um, out of all the rock and roll stars that died, the greatest loss was Jimi Hendrix. I mean, it would be different for everybody depending on where they enter the coming of age process, but Jimi Hendrix was the most original artist I ever heard or saw. He was the most incredible blues man in the true sense of what the blues is that ever lived. He's like Robert Johnson on acid from outer space. And I still think he had a lot he could do because of the, of the incredible traditions he was tapping into. He could have been a guy at 60 on a stool that with one guitar lick could still blow everybody away. And uh, I was probably most depressed and shocked at, at him dying. What do you think of MTV and the video things uh, impact on uh, rock and roll? As a visual uh, artist, you would have a different uh, point of view. When MTV started, we were <clears throat> naive and idealistic and hopeful, we thought, this is it. Everything Devo thought, everything we've been talking about, everything we've wanted to see happen, it's happening. It's really going to happen. And we're going to be rewarded. We brought him this jewel. And, uh, and we anticipated what's going on. And we were right, uh, kind of feeling. And, of course, to watch it, you know, being sprayed with FDS until it's completely de deodorized, sterilized, and sinicized, and turned inside out in terms of its purpose until it's all baby pictures for the record companies and perfume ads. It was pretty, pretty horrific and pretty sad. How about the idea of uh, combining a visual art and uh, rock and roll? From the I just think the impetus to combine vision with sound is always going to be there. It's an inevitable marriage. It's responsible for <clears throat> the most important art form we have, which is film, motion pictures. And it will only continue to be used and developed in more and more diverse and sophisticated ways on that level. And that no matter what anybody tries to do to it, somebody will manage to sneak through despite the odds, uh, just as we did for a while. Future of rock and roll. Uh, the future of rock and roll. More surprises, both uh, hideous and wonderful. Um, there's, you know, only a few artists like Devo, Sex Pistols, who change the rules. Do you think the rules still can be broken and changed? Do you think rock and roll becomes so fractured with the? Well, I mean, you're always going to have a few cattle that get out of the barnyard for a while until they're rounded up. <clears throat> and uh, that's when the excitement starts. And besides, what would those guys with the lassos have to do unless somebody was giving them a chase? <laughs>